basically the gist is you can use volunteering, specifically employee volunteering, as a means to prevent genocide. Okay, you have to unpack that a little bit. Hey there, if you've joined the podcast today, my name is Chris Jarvis. I work with companies on employee giving and volunteering programs. And my name is Jake McIsaac. I spend a lot of time thinking about public safety and restorative justice. So we are having conversations here that we've been having for 20 years. Yeah, the only difference now is we press record and share it with you. Thanks for joining us. So today we're going to talk about big things, travel, conflict, uh, the invasion of Ukraine, so big things. Yep, uh, the humanity of both sides, the dehumanizing of both sides. And how to make sense of what you're seeing, what you're hearing, and how to do that, how to find those human connections. Right, and in all of it, how to be careful not to be caught up in the dehumanizing, othering yourself. How do you know it's happening, and what do you do when you think it might be? Hey, Chris, I can see you're, you're recording uh, back home. Yeah, it's good to be back home. We, we just did a bit of travel. We were gone for a few weeks and... I'm so jealous. Yeah, I, I we were very fortunate. Um, we had to, you know, at the beginning, we were like, COVID, are we going to have the right tests? We have to test remotely, so on and so forth. And then just sort of while we were gone, the COVID thing eased up, but then got replaced with... I don't know. World War Three. I guess we didn't even get a break before that crashed in, but uh, that didn't affect travel so far. But it's. I think it's in the back. Like I was. I was kind of uh, watching your your timeline and go. All oh, those are great pictures. Lots of palm trees. Right. Right. The beach. Yeah. And then really starts the bug around travel, and then thinking, what's it going to look like in a couple weeks? Right. If this conflict starts to affect travel patterns again, and yeah, I'm like, wait. I'm worried about travel. Yeah, it's I know. War. I know. Uh, yeah. It's, Why did it's, I make this about me? <laughs> <laughs> and the four horsemen of the apocalypse, you know, yeah. you've got, you've got war, you've got uh, I, nothing to joke about here, but with uh, Ukraine and Russia's um, uh, wheat being disrupted, as well as other staples mm-hmm. coming out of the country, you have, you know, maybe famine. I don't know about pestilence disease i don't you know covid yeah we're lighting it all up here i mean it's just a little bit depressing um but my big thing uh, regarding travel is i need to be in switzerland in five weeks so that is one that could be disrupted somewhat by um the invasion of ukraine so maybe that's something we could work out here today um because i you have you been watching much obviously you've been watching the news and yeah Unfiltered yeah. news as well. I call it unfiltered. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of uh, live streams yeah. on YouTube, right? TikTok. I think, like, TikTok. Just um, sort of, yeah, uh, journalism from the street. Like yeah. just everyday people posting their stuff, their stories, Twitter. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's been heartbreaking. I think unfiltered is the right is the right word. I found a couple of folks. It's interesting. I found a couple of folks on TikTok who just are, you know, we, here's what we heard. We checked the facts. We geolocated. This is what we know. Mm-hmm. No commentary. And if they do do commentaries, they just announce it up front. They're, this is our opinion. We cannot back up anything we're saying. Here's what we think though, based on our analysis, take it for what it's worth. It's interesting. I know we're not talking about journal journalism and unfiltered news versus filtered paid for and bought news, which it all is on media stations, but it is, it is interesting to just get a glimpse from, from somebody's iPhone, both on the Russian and the Ukraine yeah. side, what's actually happening that kind of, and I've been thinking, I've been watching it. Because I'm curious about the humanity on both sides. I, I feel for both sides being forced into this because of one person's decision in a totalitarian state. It's it's extraordinary. There there is a grittiness to that level of sort of um, everyday journalism, right? I think that yeah. we thought it was this way, or at least we're socialized to believe that um, all journalists were. Um, impartial and unbiased mm-hmm. 
And then in the last number of years, is it's felt like anything but. And yep. so people are uh, looking for other sources of truth. I think that they want storytelling. They want truth telling. They want that human experience. They want to be able to see the other person uh, in some real human ways. And and uh, that's kind of what we're getting with this gritty level of social media journalism or whatever it's called. Yeah. Yeah, social media what's, journalism. What's uh, what's standing out to you as sort of the the big pieces that you're learning? What what surprised you the most? Well, in in our work, we we actually uh, with companies and organizations wanting to support corporate social responsibility, the private sector investment and community. We had been over the past few years having some really interesting discussions with some organizations in the Russian Federation and laughing with everybody on the call. And also uh, we've gone to Kiev and we've done presentations there. We know um, some people there who are working um, in their communities and trying to bring that insight to the private sector to help give more, do more to build society. So both sides, were, you know, both sides of this conflict were, we were talking to people who were very interested in those things. Um, what stood out to me is just seeing those individuals' reaction to it mm -hmm. um, on the Ukrainian side. This can't be happening. It's happening. And then just going out, not even wanting to kill the invaders, just sort of you, you're being lied to. You're being deceived. Go home. We'll give you money for your tanks. Just go home. Stop being here. Like sort of, it's quite different than what you imagine World War II was like, which was an unknown enemy, an unknown invader coming and we fight the you know and they were dehumanized so on and so forth but here there's just you know both sides are pleading for the same thing um except for a small group of individuals who have been conscripted are far away are not being told the truth are incredibly young and that's the interesting thing how you know, to be honest, Putin couldn't even sell this internally. He had to come up with the neo-Nazi line hmm. to try it, which they've been doing, I guess, for years to try and justify it because he knew his own people weren't going to go for it. You talked about your work and I, I've got to ask, so corporate social responsibility, uh, you tend to work with groups who, who say, we want to be more involved. We want to be more responsible. We want to make a difference. Yeah. We want to help in some ways. Yep. When something like this happens and it's right in your face. Does that, is that what people are asking? Hey, Chris, how, how do we help? What do we do? Like, where should people start? Well, you know, in our work, I have a talk um, that I, I give parts of or versions of. And right. basically the gist is you can use volunteering, specifically employee volunteering, because we're talking to companies, as a means to prevent genocide. Okay. You have to unpack that a little bit. All right. So um, there's a great series that everybody listening should check out. Uh, I think we've mentioned it before. We'll make sure it's in the show notes. David Eagleman, he's a neuroscientist, uh, wicked brilliant. Uh, I think he's down at Stanford now. He may have moved to the next thing, but he uh, has written several books. But in 2015, he did a series for um, PBS called The Brain, yeah. episode five, Why Should I Need You? And he, he in that episode, he wants to understand how brains connect with each other because they need each other to survive. A brain in isolation is considered torture. So it's it's sort of a, a hive, mm. but it hives to its own. So the more brains that, oh, it's stupid to talk like this, uh, like with brains, but the more you see your own reflection in those around you, uh, social identity theory, same language, mm -hmm same background, same socioeconomic status, same color, same shared experience, that kind of thing. Yeah. Same team, same high school. The more overlap you can find with others, the more like you they'll be and the more empathy you feel. But conversely, the less overlap you see, the less likely you'll see them as like you. Now, this provides an opportunity for propaganda mm -hmm. to plug into the neural net and just send a lot of messages to dehumanize the oak group. And in in Bosnia, that conflict in Bosnia, Herzegovina, um, Serbia, that Croatia, that area there, the commanders, the the leader of the country just got on and, and spouted ridiculous things. Uh, 
much like Putin. He said, you know, the Muslims are feeding our children to tigers at the zoo. No evidence. Never happened. Never happened. But it enraged the one group and they turned on the other group because it just pounded the message over and over. They're not like us. They're demons. They're not even human. They're not even human. They're not even human. Be afraid, be afraid, be afraid. And Putin has had to do exactly that with the public because he can't sell it on the, well, NATO's a threat. Do you know why? Because half of Russia wants to join NATO. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a political risk for for him. So, mm -hmm. so what I what I find interesting about what you're talking about, and I'm tracking along. I'm seeing uh, lots of stories about how this is showing up in really ugly ways, though, um, at the borders. Yep. Um, watching who is able to get out and who can't get out of Ukraine, uh, mm -hmm. particularly those who are not white. I, some of the uh, some of the language used. I mean, that's, to be fair, we're talking about different types of media. This is more traditional, but really dividing the world into Ukrainians and non-Ukrainians, mm -hmm. or Europeans, non-Europeans, um, and pretending that um, sort of the the nationality of folks is the same experience as the race of those who are trying to get out. And it does seem that at least in some stories that um, people of color are being left behind at an astonishing rate at the uh, at the borders. Yeah, not even a lot on the trains. Yeah, like the, yeah. I think there were a couple hundred Indian students and then a number of students from different countries across Africa. In the yeah. unfiltered media, they're on there saying they're not letting us on the train. They're kicking us off. They're yelling obscenities at us. And they're all in in the same situation. And so even that's the astonishing thing is the human's susceptibility to othering. It is extraordinary. And it's the only way you can have war and genocide. Well, I, w I wonder if that is speaking to a little bit of, you know, <laughs> when, when you talk to people of color, I don't think very many folks would be surprised to see um, you know, racism showing up even in these circumstances because it is for all of us our lived experience on a, on the everyday. Yep. But there's some urgency uh, created in this war environment. It's not that you can't go; it's us first. Yes. Then you. Yes. Whenever there's scarcity, it's always us first. Yes. Then you. Yes. Um, to this uh, taking care of your in group. And then whatever else comes out is the uh, out of the generosity of the surplus. We can help the others. So, and the way you're saying it now, watching it play out on the train, we would say, not good enough, folks. Like, you're all in this war and leaving these groups behind because they don't quite look enough like you because your default setting others them and giving them what's left over isn't good enough. But he, what do you think about this, Jake? Religion has institutionalized this mm -hmm. with things like tithing. Take your 90% and then with the 10%, give it to the poor, right? Mm -hmm. Which now mostly doesn't go to the poor. But in the in the biblical references, the poor were the object of that 10%. Now right. they, they get very little of it through organized religion. It's almost like the the benevolent othering is you will get some, but only after... I have mine versus the homicidal, genocidal othering, which is you're not like us and you're a threat to us. We will kill you. So there's these two kind of versions. One is a benevolent, charitable, wait till we're good. And the other one's you're the threat. We're going to kill you. So the second one isn't happening uh, at the train station. I think that is. I think that is exactly the threat. I think it is. If you get on there, I may not be able to get out. Yeah. Therefore, you represent a barrier. I have to go. I ha you you are a threat to me leaving. Huh. So if there's only so many spaces, so it's passive genocide because they're not killing them actively. They're, it's passive by leaving them back, but it's still it's still a form of othering that leads to the death of outgroups. I believe so. Yeah, because it's 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 interesting too. It's not just in who gets on the train, who gets out, wherever there's scarcity. So it's. Who gets to sleep in the tents 
in these refugee centers when there's only enough uh, beds who's left on the outside it's not just on the train it's in in these these uh, stations just off to the side of um, just inside the border as they're trying to process all the uh, all the Europeans from leaving yeah it's fascinating to see in some of these uh, unfiltered stories coming out yeah so this othering allowed Putin to mobilize the military because really this is an internal conflict. My take on it, like I, my take matters, but uh, you could say NATO provoked and it's security. But this goes back a long way to Boris Yeltsin. I read a phenomenal article by Boris Yeltsin's um, basically Secretary of State or Foreign Minister. Um, I forget what his exact title was, but he's saying... There's a group of power brokers within the country who never agreed to the Soviet Union collapsing and their intent is to build it back and they prop Putin up as their main guy to make it happen. And that's the one side. And the other side has been asking to join NATO, join the EU, become part of the system and a true democracy. And that's the side that keeps getting killed, poisoned, beat up, put in jail. So it's 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 a weird. OK, I'm going to I'm going to take a leap here. It's a weird parallel to the United States. Okay, that's where I was going. I'm like, okay, make the USSR great again. Like that's what it is. It's make the USSR great again and be a strong man. Take the actions. Take the steps. Uh, it's it's scary as can be because all of our brains and because if we go right down to it, we could always say, oh, we would never do that. But on the train getting on, Ukrainians in the middle of the war with. Students at a school that they were in their neighborhood are still going, yeah, but when it comes right down to it, me first. Right. Me first, then you. Then you. And that has always been the experience of racism. Yeah. Well, I mean, more evolved racism. I think that is definitely today. Me first, then you. I'm not saying not you. Mm. And, you know, I think that that a lot of a lot of us in racialized communities are not surprised to see that. It's just the scale. It's the urgency. It's the fact that it's so transparent right now. Uh, and people people are, I guess, some positive uh, spin is people are seeing it for what it is. There's yeah. a lot more conversation now about it because of, I think, our um, collective learning and, uh, and and attention to this. So have you been involved in any conversations uh, in your work or in the... Uh in the communities that you kind of hang out in about this specific tendency to like Ukraine is being invaded because Putin othered them by coming up with a neo-Nazi thing. By the way, for all the listeners, the neo-Nazi thing, there's like 300 people in a brigade that is very much like a smaller version of Proud Boys. And Putin invaded because he was able to exploit that. But that would be like Canada invading to say the Proud Boys tried to take over the U.S. Capitol. We're going to rescue the United States. It's like preposterous. But because human beings' brains are so want to others so badly, they're able to do it. But then on the train, there's this happening as well. So it's happening at all these weird levels. And then, of course, Jake, tell me what you've heard about this. The, the poor newscaster in the heat of the moment, stressed okay. out, saying exactly what they didn't want to say, which is, I don't want to make this comparison. I'm going to say it wrong. But can you believe Syria is happening in Europe? Now, I get the point there he was making. We thought we were beyond that. We thought we had moved beyond that. But the inference is all of the subtext, which is horribly racist, too, which obviously uh, he's probably losing sleep over himself, Re seeing that, I, I mean, that's the best version. The worst version is that he's a raging racist, but I, I, I don't know. And when the Syrians needed to get through Europe, everyone donned yellow vests and protested, but they opened the borders yeah. to folks who look like them and can, and Poland got elected, the, the, the current regime got elected on keeping out people in this very situation. Mm -hmm. And yet... So proximity, right? Proximity, yep. familiarity, similarity, these in-group markers certainly play a part. And so you asked if I've had any uh, experience. Yeah. So working on a university campus where students live in sort of um, communal housing, you share the same washrooms and the same kitchens and the same living spaces, but you have your dorm room. And so they decorate their dorm room doors to be 
uh, unique. That's their little um, identifier. Yeah, little taste of home. Yeah. Little taste. And so starting to see people put up flags in support. Yeah. Okay. And then trying to create a community where people are, we value diversity. We value it's inclusive. And then some flags show up that are Russian and some flags show up that are Ukrainian and there's conflict because mm -hmm. we've not taught people how to have conversations. Yeah, with, that's it. How to share these, uh, these views. And so really, um, yes, I've had some uh, conversations with students um, on both sides, just asking them, how does it feel? in your living space to be um, confronted with these various uh, flags from whichever one uh, yeah. view you espouse. And um, some saying it feels very, I feel safe, I feel supported. Uh, others saying I feel ostracized, but really trying to make sure that conflict doesn't, um, doesn't arise, uh, that, that they actually have the skills to talk about it. Is it, how's that going? It's going okay. Um, I think that uh, being attentive to it and really creating some spaces where there's lots of support, where there's ongoing conversations, knowing that you know uh, there are conversations that are held by professionals, like within our counseling services departments, that can bring communities together to talk when there's a particularly um, trying news cycle, and and people who are likely afraid or can't get in touch from home can't find family, people who are um, migrating across Europe. So there's some of that. So making sure people are supported, but really one-to-one, -one, making sure that students can still have conversations that are, um, that are uh, of divergent views, but be respectful that they keep the conversation, uh, keep the pathways to good communication open. So it's going okay. Yeah. It's, you know, it's hard to draw parallels because the situations mm -hmm. aren't the same. How would it have worked for you if it was 1939 and people put up flags of Poland or flags of the Nazi regime? Well, I got to tell you, as a black man, I'm not loving the flags of the Nazi regime <laughs> in 1939. But so, yeah. I, but you I'm, wouldn't have known. I mean, in Madison know. Square Garden, just years before, they had a solo crowd of Nazis saluting speakers talking about why the United States should join and support Germany. That sold out crowd in Madison Square Garden. So it is not inconceivable that if you were working on a campus in New York, that a number of students who attended that rally and were of the mindset the United States should just keep out of it and let Europe solve the problems, you would actually have to have brokered in the moment without the hindsight of all of the Holocaust, you'd have to broker a conversation, a peaceful conversation between pro-Nazi and pro-Polish people on a campus. Yeah. Well, we, you have to do that all the time uh, in, in areas of conflict. Uh, we do that in terms of uh, Middle East conflict. Like there's one of the fun things about working on a university campus is these kind of dynamics and t tensions um, exist all the time. There's an mm -hmm. undercurrent where people are... Um, learning to be the, their best versions of themselves. They tend to, though, um, take very passionate positions without significant amount of lived experience to process mm -hmm. it, but they mm -hmm. have um, certainly digested enough rhetoric. And, and so really the best chance that we have is to have uh, these minds speaking to each other and hopefully continuing to be shaped by one another to your uh, proximity to brains uh, yeah. conversation that creating the conditions for people to keep talking is our only chance. Otherwise you could just self-radicalize. Meaning you could talk yourself into the, an extreme point of view. Yeah, extreme point of view. And, and you don't have anyone else to bounce it off of. So to your, to your, uh, example of, um, being isolated or ostracized or, um, I can't remember what you said about segregated. It's torturous. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If, if you keep a human being in isolation away from other people, that's considered torture. And that is because brains need other brains in a, in a kind of a hive idea to survive. Mm -hmm. So it, it's interesting. Okay. So another, a couple aspects here, we tend to want monsters. We want to know who to root for, right? Yeah. We want to know who's, 
who's Darth Vader here? Who's Princess Leia? Which side should I be on? And the weird thing is, everybody that's on their side thinks they're on the right side. Nobody is like, oh, let's be the evil people in this scenario. Nobody's thinking that. Right? right. And there are a couple of cognitive biases. Cognitive biases are shortcuts or heuristics that we use to make sense of the world. There's two that are really interesting. And I think for everybody listening today, the interesting thing is how am I doing exactly this? So um, one is an actor observer bias, which says it, 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 this is the tendency to attribute our actions, what I did, to an right. external influence. Oh, I'm late, but it's because of traffic. Oh, I miss that, but I have so many other things going on. But the way we perceive others, we attribute their actions based on a number of variables, most of which are judgments of their character. Oh, you know why they're late? Because they're lazy or they don't pay attention to things. That's why they miss emails. So we tend to give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Yep. And other people were always quick to go, oh, I know that, that they're so unreliable. It's a judgment. And we don't even say you're five minutes past the meeting where we, we use judgment language. You are late. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Then there's the self-serving bias, which is a tendency for people to give themselves credit for success, but blame blame for your failures on outside causes or outside people. And these two things together, which are at work at all of us, in all of us all the time, even in the little things are what are undermining or leading to our openness to propaganda and the and the baloney that we're fed through filtered media mm -hmm. um, and conversations with others. You mentioned they have talking points, so they kind of come in with that, but they haven't really dug into it. And, and honestly, yeah, we just want who's right, who's wrong. And I want to know I'm right. And these shortcuts, I'll make it that way. So this is the hard work of, right? This is the hard work of creating inclusive spaces because it has to be inclusive of tough dialogue and conversations. Yeah, that, exactly. That, that are, and so part of the restorative justice or taking a restorative approach to uh, a lot of these things is to lean into difficult conversations, understand that people mm. at the root of these tensions, um, there's lots of room for learning and connecting and seeing each other. Uh, often though, people can't do it on their own. And so a facilitative approach is um, intentionally designed to bring divergent views together, asking them an equally accessible question to participate in the conversation so that they can hear each other and be shift and, and shift their views and, and, and grow. And so it's not just enough to have diverse perspectives, but really set up the container of conversation to be inclusive. That's, that takes work. That takes intention. That takes the role of a facilitator. This is why people volunteer when you're talking about volunteer opportunities. Lots of folks volunteer in their communities to be uh, restorative facilitators, conveners of these type of conversations. So as I'm watching this, and I said earlier on, I'm looking for the humanity on both sides because the, the majority of people involved in this don't want to be there, don't want to be doing what they're doing don't want to be experiencing what they're experiencing, but the system that humans have built works so well to other, to dehumanize and operate this way. And we are so used to it. It doesn't, I mean, I do think we're thinking it's absurd to have this kind of conflict in Europe. Uh, this, uh, you know, and I think we felt that very early on, like on day one, and I think we're getting used to it really fast. But what I think we could, what I'm trying to do is say, where am I othering in all of this as I, as a spectator, as an outsider, right. am I, when a Russian tank blows up, do I feel happy? That's not good. Like, I don't want this conflict to happen, but am I allowing myself to be pulled in, to be told by others? Can I retain my agency of perspective? And I'll give you an example. Uh, that you and I both experienced way back when in Halifax. So um, I remember the first time I talked to some folks in AA at the Sunday suppers. Yeah. And I asked them about, you know, the group they were going to, because I was interested in it. I wanted to know what are the 12 steps? How often do you go? Oh my gosh, 90 meetings in 90 days. And then the old timers would say 180 meetings in 90 days, if you're really serious. And I thought, this is an incredible commitment. And so I pointed at somebody else and I said, and they go to 12 step two. And they said, yeah, but they're NA. Oh, <laughs> what? NA? Narcotics Anonymous. Yeah, they're just a bunch of junkies. 
Oh. Yeah, at least we're not like them. And of course, if you talk to the NA folks, they talk about the alcoholics and the derelicts. And even though they were both working on the sobriety, they still found a way to other, not because they're bad people, but because that default setting wants to say, I'm not as bad as the next group. Right. Right. We're a little bit better. I'm a little bit better. They are at fault. They're not doing as well, but I work hard. They're just lazy. That all... And if I subtly let, when I'm watching these experiences, or even at work, when I see the interactions, and I find myself just feeling a little okay, a little happy with, quote unquote, my side getting ahead, that's a, that's a red flag for me to think, am I getting dragged into this? I don't know. What do you think about that? I think, oh man, I, I, <laughs> I think there's a lot around 12-step programs that make this an interesting thing. Uh, conversation we should dig into a little bit more sometime, but particularly how it exchanges an identity. So it creates space for people to be something other than who they were alone. Mm -hmm. uh, it builds community really quickly in 90 mm -hmm. days, 90 minutes, 90 mm -hmm. days, where I'm seen as a friend of mm -hmm. Bill W. Sharing I, intimate, I share, vulnerable details. And people say, I see you. I'm mm. like you. Yeah. It is onboarding. Uh, in a really in fast, deliberate yeah. way yeah. that almost sets up the unforeseen consequence of uh, creates an in-group, out-group. Out yeah. So then it's just different enough. They're similar, but they're, they're not the same. Yeah. And um, it allows people to find that lane way because it's, it's not us. We're us. This yeah. is our identity collectively. Because that, that is definitely playing out Ukraine, Russia, because they speak Russian. It's like, it's like America invading Canada and the Canadians are like, what, what? We watch your shows. We eat your food. Why? Why? Right? It's just, uh, and it had to be manufactured. Putin had to bring in the Nazi other because other, it, it could not have gotten Russians to go along with this otherwise. And most of them are not, I, would, I wouldn't think. So, Jake, you, you're dealing with us on the campus. You've dealt with this in the past. This is kind of the focus of a lot of your work. As I'm watching this and I'm feeling myself pulled one way or the other, and I think, well, is it the political thing? Is there a right or wrong? What's going on? And I'm just trying to make sense. I'm sense making this every single day. Any guidance based on what you've seen? Keep trying to do things that help you make sense. So the rational discourse, having people to talk about this with, keep okay. che checking in with folks, uh, maintain your curiosity. It, I think it's easy to binge and then get overwhelmed. And then in binging, uh, it doesn't allow uh, for a lot of reflection because right. it's just it's just taking it in, consuming, right. consuming hours and hours and hours. And then you're done and I need something else. Right. <laughs> Leave some time instead of binging to the leave room, leave room for talking it over, leave room to stay curious, leave room to be thinking about it. Um, and, you know, do some self care. Be, make sure that uh, it's done in balance, uh, that there's plenty of access to a range of views and, and perspectives, and look for those uh, pathways where you can see the human. Exactly yeah. like what you said. I think that's our only way out. Yeah, that's good. And that's not always easy to look at a, a person or a character because I, I mean, a snap, just a quick shot and a, and a comment. I, I don't know who that person is, but the, the, the moment I'm willing to dehumanize them as nothing like me mm -hmm. is a moment I think I'm headed to the same place as that person is. I hear you. All right. Well, thanks for talking this through. It's been yeah. heavy, but I, I appreciate it. But interesting. Yeah. Okay. See you next time. See you, buddy. Bye. This has been a Podstarter production. production.